When I was six years old, that was the, the first time I was molested. I, I was in the first grade and, and I remember just being so excited about school and about this time of life. I mean, I, I, the playground at our school was sick. I was starting to finally get this reading thing down and you add in the He-Man and the newly invented Nintendo, and I, I was living life large. But I remember being confused. I, I look back now and I realize I, I just didn't even have a clue what was going on. I had no idea that my parents were struggling to make ends meet. I, I had no idea that we had just lost our home to the bank all I knew was we had just moved from St. Louis to Indiana, and the moment that we settled into our new apartment, my dad got transferred back down to St. Louis, and so he would go and work there throughout the week, and then he would come and visit us on the weekends, and my mom was slaving away, working as hard as she could just so we could stay in our new apartment. And so I was a latchkey kid, you know, one of those kids that because both parents our work, they come home after school and they have to stay there for a couple of hours until their parents get home. But, but since I was in first grade, my parents had Joe babysit me. Joe was my babysitter. You know, the one that, that was supposed to protect me. The one that was supposed to look after me. The one entrusted with my heart and my mind in my body, which is why it was so confusing for me the first time Joe molested me. You know, I, I, I remember going to school and being so excited to see friends and so excited for all that I was learning. And then there was some time after lunch, I would start to get this knot in my stomach because I didn't want to go home and face Joe. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to look to. I didn't know how to, to put together what was happening to me. All I knew was I hated him. And my hate for Joe began to grow in my own heart as a hatred towards me and eventually everyone around me. And for over 25 years, I told no one. Instead, I just built walls up of my pain, went inside of my room, and I hid. I hid. You know, it's easy for us to talk about the beauty of the cross. I mean, it's easy for us to talk about this rescue mission of God, but you know what? It's easy to forget that our story is filled with pain. That the story of the cross is filled with pain. That the pain in our story doesn't go away with just one sermon on the beauty of the cross. Because if, if I'm being honest with you, the majority of my life, I've not identified with the garden so much. I've not identified even with the resurrection so much. The majority of my life, I have identified with the words that Jesus cries out on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
Where are you? Did you mean have you abandoned me? Why have you left me? Why is it when I turn around, you are nowhere to be found? No, when it comes to my story, the part of the cross that I connect with the most is these words, which is why it's, it's somewhat comforting for me when I go to passages like Psalm 13 and I hear them cry out, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle in my soul and all day have sorrow in my heart? Behold me, look at me, and answer, Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. For 25 years, I kept the sexual abuse hidden away from everyone, away from myself, and even away from God, hiding in this room of my own protection, my room, this room of my own making, to protect me from the pain, to protect me from Joe, to, to protect me from God. But the reality is it didn't protect me. It imprisoned me. It incarcerated me so that, sure, I knew about love and joy and happiness, but I only experienced them muffled and through a wall. And so for most of my life with God, I have cried out this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Only now I begin to realize that when Jesus cried this out on the cross, he didn't share my sentiment. No, he wasn't accusing the Father with these words. Instead, Jesus was singing a song. As a matter of fact, he was singing from Psalm 22. These are the first words of Psalm chapter 22. Psalm 22 begins like this, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. I cry by night, but there's no rest for me. The psalmist begins this hymn with a powerful plea for God to respond, for God to be present. But what's interesting is in verse 3, the psalmist begins to change the tune. In verse 3 it says, And yet, you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praises of Israel, and you, our ancestors, trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried out, and they were saved. In you they trusted, and they were not put to shame. Why was Jesus singing this psalm? I mean, there's 150 psalms. He could have chosen any of them, but he chose this one on the cross. Sure, the psalm begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But just a couple of verses, verses in, he says, and yet you never abandoned us in the past. And there's this hint in the psalmist's desperation that he believes that what God has done in the past, he will also do in the present. Why was Jesus singing this psalm? Verses 6 through verse 15, it, the psalmist continues to wrestle, struggling with what he is feeling, but also remembering the movement of God until we get to verse 16. In verse 16, I begin to wonder if we're at the foot of the cross and we've actually moved away from the, from the halls of David. Because listen to this, listen to verse 16. 
dogs surround me. A gang of evildoers encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Why is Jesus singing this psalm? I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Why is Jesus singing this psalm? I think it's because Jesus knows not just how this psalm begins. He knows how it ends. You see, there's a part of this psalm that we have to understand that what we see as abandonment actually may be where God does his greatest work. As a matter of fact, the psalm does not agree that God has forsaken him. The psalmist himself says in verse 23, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All the offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe before him, all the offspring of Israel. Listen. For he did not despise or scorn the suffering of the afflicted one. He did not hide his face from him. But he has heard his cry for help. Why did Jesus sing this psalm? You know, it's easy in a world caught between two trees to be blinded by what's actually in front of us. It's easy whenever we are in the prisons, in the walls that were meant to protect us, to begin to believe that God has abandoned us, that God has forsaken us. But when Jesus was in the darkest moment of his story, when he is hanging on the cross, he begins to sing a psalm. And maybe it's a psalm that he had sung many times before. Maybe it was a psalm that, that Joseph used to hum while they were working in their workshop. Maybe it's a psalm that Jesus sang to his disciples as they were walking up the Mount of Olives. At the cross of Jesus Christ, he begins to sing the song. And even though we understand the words that begin the psalm, there is a call for us to also understand how this melody ends. Because in verses 29 through 31, the message of the cross rings through most clearly. All the rich of the earth will feast and bow down and worship. All who go down to the dust will fall down before him. Those who can't keep themselves alive. No, no, no. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will come and they will proclaim his righteous deeds to a people yet unborn, announcing he has done it. He has done it. Why did Jesus sing this psalm? It's because the beginning reminds us of the pain and the wounds of our story in this world caught between two trees. But the ending reminds us that we do not have a God that abandons us. We have a God that meets us in our deepest wounds. We have a God that invites us to transform the wounds of our hands into the scars of our own resurrection. All we have to do is to bring out our stories and allow the light to shine on them so that darkness can no longer hold them, so that the stories themselves can no longer imprison us, but instead they can be subsumed into the wounds of Jesus Christ, changing our song from why have you forsaken me to he has done it.